Our reading today comes from Psalm 44. It's the entire psalm, and so we'll hear this read together, and I'll invite Karen forward to uh, share the reading. Thank you. Thank you. Psalm 44. O oh God, we have heard with our ears, our fathers have told us what deeds you performed in their days, in the days of old. You, with your own hand, drove out the nations, but them you planted, you afflicted the peoples, but you set them free. For not by their own sword did they win the land, nor did, they arm, did their own arm save them, but your right hand and your arm and the light of your face, for you delighted in them. You are my King, O God, ordain salvation for Jacob. Through you we push down our foes, through your name we tread down those who rise up against us. For not in my bow, bow do I trust, nor can my sword save me, but you have saved us from our foes and have put to shame those who hate us. In God we have boasted continually, and we will give thanks to your name forever, Shela. But you have rejected us and disgraced us, and have not gone out with our armies. You have, you have made us turn back from the foe, and those who hate us have gotten good spoil. You have made us like sheep for slaughter, and have scattered us among the nations. You have sold your people for a trifle, demanding no high price for them. You have made us taught of our neighbors and derision and scorn of those around us. You have made us a byword among the nations, a laughing stock among the peoples. All day long my disgrace is before me and shame has covered my face at the sound of the taunter and the reviler at the sight of the enemy and the avenger. All this has come upon us, though we have not forgotten you, and we have not been, been false to your covenant. Our heart has not turned back, nor have our steps departed from your way. Yet you have broken us in the place of jackals and covered us with the shadow of death. If we have forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, I would not, I would not God discover this, for he knows the secrets of the heart, yet for your sake we are killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Awake! Why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and oppression? For our soul is bowed before, bowed down in the dust. Our belly clings to the ground. Rise up, come to our help. Redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. This is the name of the Lord. Okay, so let's, let's join together in prayer. Our Lord and God, we give thanks to you for your word. And we also thank you that you work in our lives and you draw new insights into our awareness. And we pray that you would speak to our hearts today, that we would grow in your word and that we would also grow in our faith. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Anyone here a morning person? Anyone consider themselves a morning person? Yeah, a few. Yeah, and I see some nudges too to say, you better admit to that. Yeah. Well, I, I used to be the opposite of a morning person, like the opposite. I still wouldn't say I'm a morning person now. It, it still takes me some time to wake up mentally after I've gotten up physically. But I wake up now at a decent time. I, I don't find I can even sleep in really anymore, although uh, that was not true when I was younger. When I was in high school, basically school started around 9 a.m. The bell rang, I think, at 8.55, and then Canada was played, followed, followed by the announcements, and then class would begin. 
So every morning, though, was the same routine for me. My stepdad would come into my room, maybe it was 8.15, 8.30. He'd turn the lights on and say, out of that roost, up and at them. The sun is shining. And then he'd say things like that and stand there for like five minutes. As, and then and he'd finally leave. <laughs> I really didn't enjoy those, those days, I gotta admit. But I, I wanted to stay in bed as long as possible. So I'd stay in bed until about 8.45, splash some water on my face, get dressed and run out the door. It took me a few minutes to get ready and a few minutes to get to school. So I was on time about 50% of uh, the, the days, if I ran. Anyway, I, I still sleep, but I don't really sleep in anymore. But we might ask, does God sleep? As humans, we sleep, but does God sleep? Normally, we, we just say, well, of course not. No, God doesn't sleep. However, when God became human in Christ, he could sleep like us, right? There's, in fact, there's one example I can think of in the Bible when Jesus slept. And do you know that time? It's when he calmed the storm, right? Do you know that story? Basically, Jesus was out on the water with his disciples and a storm came suddenly and everyone in the boat was, was afraid that they were going to sink. Except Jesus, because there he was on a cushion, fast asleep. Isn't it nice to think you can sleep through anything? Uh, some of us can, some of us can't. But there he was, God incarnate, asleep. Now, does God normally sleep though? Well, we wouldn't think so, but we'll come back to the story of Jesus a little later on. That, but that idea of God sleeping comes up today in our reading in Psalm 44. This is a psalm with some surprising twists and turns when you think about it. The three main sections of the psalm are, are the good old days remembered, beginning in verse 1. Then you've got the current troubles and confusion beginning in verse 9. And then a prayer questioning God beginning in verse 23. And it's in that third section when God is asked, why? Why is he asleep? And we might wonder, well, is that a correct perception or is that some kind of challenging question? What is going on there? Well, we'll come to that later. But we remember that the Psalms are written from the human perspective. They are scripture, but they're written from the believer's perspective. And sometimes uh, we experience th things from uh, an incomplete perspective. We don't always see things exactly as they are, and that can be conveyed in the Psalms as well. Sometimes we can be confused. Uh, we, we can do these very things, any one of us as believers. We can think about the good old days. We can be surrounded by our current troubles and with confusion. And we can also have prayers that are questioning God, why? We can feel all of these things, but we'll walk through the psalm and, and maybe you'll see how these connect even to you in your life. But it all starts with, of course, the good old days. Whoops, I'm in somewhere else, aren't I? There, the good, the good old days. You see, the good old days are what we think of, when we often think of the past, sometimes we just forget what wasn't so good back in the past. Psalm 44 starts off like that, saying, O God, we have heard with our ears, our fathers have told us what deeds you performed in their days, in the days of old. Oh, doesn't that sound good? The days of old, right? You look back and things were just great. And you know what? To be honest, when I look back on my high school days, I'm usually thinking about the good stuff. It's only when I force myself to say, wait a minute, I didn't like getting woken up every morning, did I? I've got to remember the, the tough stuff too. But normally we look back and think, yeah, those were pretty good days. We might even say, those were the days. Those were the days. And, and we know what that means. We mean, it means those were good days. But when you think of it, it's kind of an incomplete idea. Those were the days. What does that even mean? The days of what? Have you thought about that phrase before? If you were just to, to take uh, it at face value? Well, so it was funny. The other night at the dinner table, my family was reminiscing about the vegetable garden that we didn't bother to plant this year. We had grown uh, different things. 
Uh, things like zucchinis were among them, and we grew way more zucchinis than we ever needed. But with the surplus of zucchinis, my, my wife had a zucchini loaf recipe, a chocolate zucchini loaf, which was actually delicious. Anyone had one of those that's really good? Yeah, yeah, there's my daughter putting her hand up because she knows. And you know, Suzanne would use them, make a really wonderful chocolate zucchini loaf. And so after she said, yeah, we didn't have a garden this year, but we did, yeah, we did used to have that garden with the zucchinis and the zucchini loaves. And then she and I said in unison, those were the days. And then without missing a beat, our son piped in and said, that I liked. Those were the days that I liked. That's really what it means though, isn't it? When I say those were the days, those were days that I liked. He got the right idea. Well, this is what the psalmist is saying. We heard the stories, Lord, of the days of old, the stories our fathers have told us. Those were the days. Those were the days that I liked, or I would have liked if I could have been there. And that psalm speaks of the, the past of the nation of Israel, the people of God coming into the promised land. They were winning their battles all because of God's blessing. It was not by their own strength, not by their sword did they win the land, nor, nor did their own arm, their own strength save them, but it was by God's right hand and his arm and by the light of his face because he delighted in them. And so it even goes in the psalm, sounds so much like any other psalm of praise. I don't trust in my own bow, nor, sword my, nor can my sword save me, but you have saved us from our foes, and you have put to shame those who hate us. God, you give us the victory time and time again. It's all about God providing the victory to his people. And he even ends this first section with this, in God we have boasted continually, and we will give thanks to your name forever. Selah. And wouldn't that be great if the psalm just ended there? You'd say that's like any normal psalm of praise. Wouldn't it be great? It sounds like your typical psalm. But in verse 9, he says this. But you have rejected us and disgraced us. In verse 13, you have made us the taunt of our neighbors, the derision and scorn of those around us. So we've heard about the good old days. And he talks about the good old days. Why? So we can say, you know, those were the good old days, but those aren't today. Those were good old days because today is not as good. Do you ever look back and relive some wonderful memories and think to yourself, man, those were the, those were the days. God has been so good to me. And then you... You, you think to yourself right after that, okay, now, why isn't God as good to me today? Why aren't things quite as good now as they were then? This is kind of this big surprise that comes way, partway through the psalm. We've got, yeah, we have this, the good old days remembered, and then what happens in verse 9? Well, there are current troubles. And that's pretty confusing. We had great days, and then all of a sudden, no, but God... Now things aren't going so well. And in the same way, he relates this to the people of Israel, his nation, which was kind of like the church uh, in Old Testament times. It was confined really to one nation. People from other nations could come into uh, the nation of Israel, become the people of God. But it was really confined really to one nation. When Christ came, he sent disciples into all the world. And now disciples are, are made of all nations. Nevertheless, we can continue can relate this to the church. We might say, you know, for the church, weren't there the good old days? Have you ever thought about that in the history of the church or our own society? Said, man, I wish we could be back in the good old days. Anyone ever feel that way? Or you think everything's always getting better? Is that, I mean, that kind of a church. No. <laughs> the reality is that things sometimes go south. Things don't go the way we want. We look in, at Western Christianity, we could see the rise and fall of Christendom. Now, sure, the, the gospel spread around the world some places. There are more people coming to faith than not. And, and the gospel is reaching new lands. But in our country, even in Canada, our churches today, for the most part, 
are facing more struggles, more challenges than they ever had in their history. You know, years ago, being a Christian would have been considered a socially beneficial thing to be, but now it comes at a social cost. This is pro even minor compared to some persecution that people face in other parts of the world. You know, if you, but even here, if you were to say, hey, I'm a Christian, I don't think people would pat you on the back for that, for the most part. It would come more at a social cost than, than it would be a social benefit. You might actually want to hide your faith a little bit and say, hey, uh, are you going to church? Yeah, let's not say that too loud in a public place, right? Because we don't want to be embarrassed. We, we, we have apprehension maybe about even praying in public before we eat a meal. Have you ever felt a little uncomfortable? Maybe with a group of non-believing Christian friends, non-Christian friends, you say, you know, maybe it's difficult to express your faith in some context. Nevertheless, this is a challenge, right? Why, why is it that the world just doesn't become more and more Christian? Why aren't things even easier and easier over time? Why do bad things happen to the church? Why do bad things happen to us? If God can do great things in the past, why is he doing the, the, the great things today? In fact, even greater things. And it's not as though these troubles are, are because the church has always been unfaithful or, or a Christian hasn't been a very good Christian. Notice this, it's, it's not just that there are current troubles, there's also a confusing piece here. There's confusion. Because in verse 17 it says, All this has come upon us, though we have not forgotten you, and we have not been false to your covenant. This person is saying, God, we've been faithful, and we're still facing these hardships. Our heart has not turned back, nor have our steps departed from your way, yet you have broken us in the place of jackals and covered us with the shadow of death. Even though we were faithful, things have gotten bad for us. Now, I'd understand it if, you know, we'd forgotten you. We, we worshipped idols. He says, if we'd forgotten the name of our God or spread our hands to a foreign God, would God not discover this? For he knows the secrets of the heart. But that's not the situation. This is about someone who's been faithful to God. Even a church has been faithful to God. But they still face the struggles and troubles of life. And it's very confusing. That's confusing, isn't it? Why don't good things always happen to good people? Or at least God's people. But he says this, Yet for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. And that's a confusing thing, isn't it? Why is it that God's godly people are like sheep to the slaughter? Now, of course, this is a, a big theological question. But maybe one that we haven't, uh, you know, it's one that we have probably addressed before. And in fact, if you look at the main symbol of Christianity, we certainly understand that suffering does go hand in hand with being righteous and godly. Who's the most righteous and godly individual who's ever walked the face of the earth? Jesus Christ. But what did he have to face? He had to go to the cross. So we don't connect being good and godly and righteous with everything going perfectly well in your life. That's just not the world we live in. In fact, we could even see the opposite. The more godly you are, the more trouble you might face for being so different from the rest of the world. And that's certainly what Jesus encountered and it's something that we have to encounter too. As it says, for your sake we are killed all the day long. For your sake, because we are Godly, for God's sake, we suffer. And did you know that verse 22 is in fact quoted in the New Testament? Do you know where that's quoted? In Romans chapter 8. Do you know that passage where it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written... For your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, the apostle says, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. His point is not that we won't face trouble, we won't face 
opposition. People will always be nice to us. No, he says, we're going to face these things for God's sake. Nevertheless, we are more than conquerors because of the love of Christ. And the love of Christ is one that brings us through death into life everlasting. It is the promise of his resurrection and the life uh, to come. We are more than conquerors. And to sum up this whole thing, you can just see that that's what Romans 8 is about. I imagine Paul was, or was thinking about uh, uh, probably Psalm 44 when he quoted it. Because this is the theological answer. Why do bad things happen? Well, Romans 8.28 sums it up pretty well. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. The point isn't that things are always good. It's that God is always working things out for good. That's the good that God has planned. God has this loving and amazingly good plan. And while our, in our freedom we do bad things, people do bad things to us, things don't go the way they should. Nevertheless, God is the one who reigns over all, and God's plan is to make everything work for good. Not be good in itself, but work for for good and he works it for good because he can nevertheless there are times when we look back on the good old days and we say why aren't they as good today we're in current troubles and we're confused and that's still a human experience and so even though someone might say hey God has a plan you might even say hey I know God has a plan doesn't mean it's always easy doesn't mean that you don't feel that same confusion of like why is this happening we can still feel that and that's fair that's what i what's so wonderful about this psalm is that it shows that it's fair to feel confused as a believer because there it is in scripture you have a believer feeling confused why are these happening why are these things happening but that brings us to what we do when we're all confused what would you do if you're confused about what's going on well wouldn't you go to prayer that's a good thing. But the prayer that we have, oh, I, and I have the wrong thing, but we'll put all three together. What kind of a prayer do we encounter here? But it's a prayer of questioning God. And so we think maybe we've got this great introduction to the psalm of, hey, remember the good old days? Oh, but times are tough now, and it's really confusing because we're actually godly. We're not getting punished for doing the wrong thing. Life is hard and doesn't make sense to me. So I'm going to pray about it. And what's that prayer? God, wake up. <laughs> That's their prayer. Kind of shocking in a way. Almost insulting. It's awake. Why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and oppression? Rise up. Come to our help. It's the why, 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 why are you asleep? Now this is not a flattering way to describe any situation it's almost implying that god is like sleeping on the job and in terms of any part of scripture that has a believer kind of acting in a not so pious way it strikes us as as a strange thing to find in the bible it does like what do we do with this prayer when we say hey scripture is always true but here's a strange uh, type of prayer it's all about why 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 god why are you asleep well the point here isn't that God is sleeping, but it certainly feels that way sometimes to those who are calling out to God. God wasn't really asleep, but it can feel like God's asleep because you're going through something that hasn't been solved and it seems to be prolonging itself and continuing on. And you're like, God, why? Why is it? And, and well, is God like us? And maybe God's like asleep. It's just an imagination. It's an idea thrown out there from the person who's simply crying out to God, why is this happening? We can theologically say, no, God doesn't sleep. Right? Look back to Psalm 121. He won't let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither sleep nor slumber. God doesn't sleep. God's always aware. God's never sleeping on the job. And so what we have here in Psalm 44 isn't an example of a perfect prayer. It's a perfect example of how our prayers aren't perfect. 
We come before God from our hearts. We say, God, I don't understand. I'm confused. God, why is this happening? And even our prayers, they're not perfect. This, this isn't an example of a perfect prayer. It's a perfect example of how our prayers aren't perfect. And you might say, well, where is that in the Bible that says our prayers aren't perfect? Well, go back to Romans 8. <laughs> go back to Romans 8. In verse 26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. You see, we're, we, we should pray, we do pray, but the Bible tells us we don't always do a good job at prayer. We don't always pray the right way. And we, maybe we, we uh, go too far. But let's go back to that wonderful example of God actually sleeping. Who is that? Jesus in the boat. In Mark chapter 4, it's in other Gospels too, but in Mark 4, it says Jesus leaves the crowd. And they took him, the disciples took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And the other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling with water. This is how desperate it was. But he was in the stern asleep on the cushion. Now, I don't know about you, but some people can sleep more easily than others, right? Anybody a good sleeper out there? Anybody a terrible sleeper? Like your spouse rolls over and you wake up, right? Yeah. I'm a better sleeper than my wife. <laughs> so I'm more likely to wake her up than vice versa. Kids cry in the night. I don't know. I didn't hear that. <laughs> Slept great. But here's the thing. We, we, Jesus apparently is one of those good sleepers. Who knew? Storm's going on. There's water filling things up. And he's asleep. But that's a problem. He's asleep in the stern on a cushion. And it says, they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? They're basically saying, wake up. And he awoke and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said to them, now this is interesting. How does he react? He said, hey, that's great. You know, ask me why I'm sleeping, get all upset and feel worried. And I commend you for that. No, he doesn't do that. What does he say? He says, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who is this then that even the wind and the sea obey him? They realized he was more than a man. That Jesus was, in fact, someone greater than anyone they had ever seen before. But maybe they even had a hint that this was God, the God who could sleep. But the interesting thing I see here is that even though Jesus could sleep there, even when he was asleep, he wasn't going to let anything happen to his disciples. Nothing totally disastrous, because he still had the plan to redeem them, even from this life, to give them life in the future, life to come. He was not giving them a, a pass to say, oh yeah, you were really afraid, and you cried out to why, why are you sleeping? And he said, oh, that's a fine prayer. No, he said instead, oh, ye of little faith, right? Where's your faith? He said, have faith instead. Nevertheless, when we read this Psalm and we have current troubles and confusion that don't seem to line up with the good old days, we have a prayer maybe questioning God there's a place for that, and God can, in his mercy, handle that. He can handle that. Now, we're not recommending that. <laughs> you know, that's not exactly faith. But God understands the weakness of our faith. And God can handle that and say, okay, you're asking me why. And you'll get an answer eventually, but it's okay to ask me why. It's okay to feel afraid and desperate. But I love how this psalm ends. This psalm seems at first to, to kind of end on a, a sour note or a sad note. But in, re in, in reality, at the end, it has a really nice ending because although it says, rise up, come to our help, it also says, redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. That's the final line of this psalm. For the sake of your steadfast love. In Hebrew, it's the chesed. 
That is the steadfast love of God. God is not one way in the, in the past and different way in the future. God is a constant God. And so when you look back and say, who was God back in the good old days? Well, he's the same God today. And there's that just a little hint of faith at the end of the psalm. Redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. That is faith. That's faith at the end. So we see here, yeah, we can remember the good old days. And yeah, we can acknowledge our current troubles. We can even feel confused. You can have a prayer questioning God. But you know, here's what I really get out of this psalm. When things seem confusing and troublesome... You know what? That's the right time to think back to the good old days. To think that's the time to think back to the good times. Think back to the good old days. Read the accounts of God's wonderful works in the Bible. Or think back to some of the greatest moments and turning points in your own life. Do that and say, those were the days. Those were the days that I liked. Go ahead and do that. Because in those days, we see the signs pointing us to God's mighty, wonderful, always present, though not always evident, steadfast love. And when you know that that is your God, you can get through it all. To God be the glory forever. Amen.
Now let us go, trusting in the goodness of our Lord, and may the blessing of God go with us. May the love of God our Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.